This is our Agile Thought virtual community um, event. And for today's event is what we're calling Agile Heard Around the World. Uh, and I will be your co-host today. I am super, super excited about this um, for a host of different reasons. And these are some of those reasons right here. All right, so this was really kind of spawned out of the desire to know how others see Agile, not just within different companies, not just within uh, you know, different places in the US, but, but how do people see Agile and, and where do we think it is um, around the globe? And so, I am very thankful for the guests that we have today uh, for the panel. Uh, so for myself, I'm a principal transformation consultant with Agile Thought. We also have Gabriela Correa from uh, Brazil, who is an Agile coach and project manager with BRQ Digital Solutions. So thank you, Gabriela, for joining us. We have Chandan Patri, uh, who is an enterprise change transformation lead at Samsung. He is also the author of three books on agile and leadership. And Chanjan is from India. And we have Ola Berg, uh, who is a change strategist and agile guide with Nimble Tribe, who is from Sweden. I like that name, Nimble Tribe. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> and we have Abby Osaba from Nigeria, who is an international business agility coach and trainer with the Agile Advisor Africa. Thanks for joining. All right. So we will just want to give a little bit of background really quick on Agile Thought, um, because without Agile Thought, we would not be able to do this. Uh, so Agile Thought is located across six countries, uh, founded in the year 2000. We have roughly uh, 3,000 consultants. We are comprised of three uh, practice areas where we call transform, build, and run. And thanks again um, to Agile Thought for helping us with this today. All right, so we have certain topics and I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen at this point. And we are just going to dig into the topics that we have. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the agile culture of teams and, and organizations and what that looks like in different areas. And so I'm curious to know, look, what impact have you seen Agile have on uh, company culture uh, in particular uh, in your areas? And so, uh, Gabriella, we'll, we'll just start with you. Okay. Uh, so what I see uh, is that leaders are giving more autonomy and also uh, asking employees to have more responsibility in their jobs. So that's something that is really changing here in Brazil, the way that we manage and lead people. Uh, and also uh, thinking about the employees, uh, the, the feeling of ownership is something that's also changing. Uh, and uh, last, uh, I can say that uh, the customer satisfaction is something that is changing, the way that uh, companies are uh, working to satisfy uh, the clients, the way that we are creating products and solutions in order to really create solutions and uh, deliver value for the customers. Nice. Well, what about you, Ola? What, what are you seeing? Well, we see, um, actually, we, we, we see now, now is the time in Sweden where, where Agile is really challenging the culture because it, it has been brewing within the IT department, within IT development for, for a long while and created this kind of bubble that now bursts into the rest of the, the organizations. All organizations now tend to realize that, oh, we actually are an IT business. And so, so everything that the Agile Manifesto talks about with 
business people and developers should work together closely day to day, tear down the walls. Everyone's the same. We should be focusing on delivering value to continuous delivery to, to, to the customer. That really starts to, to take on hold. And what we now see is often a kind of a culture war where because culture is, is, is very often the thing that you you never mention. You 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 don't spell out culture. Culture is lived. And all of a sudden, mm. here, here comes the, this thing that, that is really challenging your, your, your culture. And then you realize that, oh, the behaviors that we have had as a business as a whole has actually been been, been grounded in, in, in a lot of behaviors that we never, we thought that were, were natural. But now with Agile is coming and actually challenges us. So, so now we're seeing friction. Uh, uh, that is what I see in, in, in many places, especially since many agile operations like Spotify and so forth have had a huge success in Sweden. Nice. And so, Abby, what, what are you seeing in Nigeria? So in Nigeria, uh, what has happened uh, is that I actually been in Canada for 20 years, relocated three years ago. So I started the community. And so my experience has been with uh, the work I've been doing there for three years uh, with different clients and with people in the community. And so what I have seen um, in three years is that there has been the awareness. People have started to embrace Agile. Uh, a lot of organizations cutting across different domain areas and industries. And um, some are ready and willing and have been uh you know doing it the right way you know partnering with a with a coach or a, a consulting company or a trainer and some have tried to do it by themselves uh a few of those organizations their leadership have the understanding of uh doing away with demand command and control and a few are still struggling overall uh just like ola said Culture is a huge, huge impact that cuts across mm -hmm. the race, the gender, um, the, the beliefs, uh, the tradition and religion. And so there's a lot of struggle with uh, different organizations as they try to embrace the agile culture versus their traditional culture, because culture gets into the organization somehow, regardless of whatever the culture of the organization is that HR passes out to employees, but somehow uh, things find their way. And so there's still that tr struggle and, uh, but it just means that there's still a long way to go and there's a lot of work to do. Nice. So Chandan, what are you saying with regards to culture and teams and organizations? Yeah, so what I am seeing, like um, every organization I go, like um, last uh, six years, I have worked on three different organizations for transmission related activities. I see every organization is different. Their business context <clears throat> are different. Challenges are different. Uh, and, and as and when the, the business are in different countries, it, that country culture significantly influence the organization culture. And, uh, and what I do see is actually people are mostly doing as a religion practice, like it's a doing going on. So uh, culture is not getting impacted so that the, the real transmission is not happening. So the true collaboration culture is supposed to be happen. It, it's it, there's a struggle going on, like um, the <clears throat> old legacy versus the new um, legacy, and there is a <clears throat> tussle going on, micromanagement, hierarchy of dribble versus this collaboration and flat. So a lot of turbulence are happening. So as an agile coach, we are part of this turbulence and trying to really steer through everything. So ideal culture, uh, I'm seeing it takes a lot of time to really come to a sustainable state, but but it's far away from that sustainable state, what we are seeing like collaboration and cultivation culture. So a lot of struggle is going on in, in the transformation space. Yeah, and, and I like something, uh, I like everything that you all said, but something in particular to, that you just said, Chandan, around uh, how transformation hasn't really happened if the culture hasn't changed, alluding to that. And the culture is so important within the organization and you know you can put all the frameworks you can put uh, all those things in place but if you don't change the culture then you aren't really changing how people make decisions and how they're thinking through things 
Uh, and until you do that, I completely agree, transformation hasn't really taken place. So I'm curious, you all also mentioned, uh, and Abby, you, you specifically mentioned about the leaders uh, in organizations. So what are you seeing in terms of how leaders are reacting to uh, an agile approach or the agile mindset? What I've seen basically is that because of the awareness, um, I hate to say agile being a buzzword, uh, but there's a lot of noise around Agile across the world. So leaders who have traveled, attended conferences, are speaking to their counterparts, and they all know Agile, and it's the way to go. They're being told, you know, your company needs to be doing Agile, blah, blah, blah. And so they have this sense of urgency to do Agile within their organization. And then, um, of course, that uh, aside from the culture issues, then they are saddled with the change, what change would look like. And so they are holding back, they're really afraid. Um, they know, they try to just pick on the things that they hear and read. Agile will bring about speed, you know, you'll be able to uh, get your teams to work faster and you save money, you save time, and they just stop there. <laughs> and uh, when you now try to help them understand, uh, it's a journey uh, that eventually would allow, you know, while that journey is going on, you start to see, savings you start to see time to market and start to see a lot of beautiful things uh they're not really ready to put in the work that's required and uh also they start to think of the costs and i am always a, a a preacher to say that change when uh when when you do change when you you know you do change voluntarily uh, it's not as expensive as when change becomes involuntary. It's always more expensive. And so uh, you have to choose, make a decision. And so um, a few of them who, you know, here. So what I do usually when I work with clients, I make the, the leader uh, do a video to talk about the, like their testimonial. And mm -hmm. I try to, I don't put it out there. I think I, maybe I have two out there, but most of the time I have it uh, in a private folder and I share that. So in a private meeting, I would say, would you like to hear somebody else? Maybe not your type of organization, their own testimonial. And I play that. I play one or two. And usually that works like a charm. And then we try to start going through, you know, the nitty gritty, walking them, holding by them by the hand. I have this meeting coming up on Monday and the leaders are like, Abby, now people are being uh, they're doing agile the way we want. We're trying, we're seeing changes, but then how do we reward people? Nice. Get into a, get into a meeting with us. So some of them are allowing, you know, myself and some other people to handhold them through that journey. And then some are still struggling with change, what change would look like and cost and so many other things. And, uh, but I would say overall, uh, I would say half and half right. with regards to, leaders who are really embracing the change and leaders who are struggling. Yeah, and, and I find that uh, something that you mentioned earlier, and I, I usually refer to it as the cheaper, faster kind of thing. You know, they hear cheaper, faster, and then that's where they want to go. Uh, yeah, Ola. Uh, question, follow-up question to Abba there. Um, we... Um, you, you talked about them, they're not willing to, to put in the work that it takes. The, the leaders, they want the reward, just like kids. They want the rewards, but they're not willing to put in the work. Could that be because it's very much uh, about um, emotional labor? Mm. That's a completely different kind of work. Mm. Do, you, do you recognize that? Or? Yes, 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 I agree. I agree. So uh, to answer that question, I'll give you a scenario. So one client, uh, I said, we have to do a working session and it's going to take about two, three days because uh, we had done some work and we needed to change structure. And I said, we need to all be, it will be hands on deck, two, three days locked in so that we can all think, strategize and just get it done once and for all. And it was a pain. It was a pain. People couldn't get away from their day-to-day. -day. They, 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 they just thought, why would we need so much time? And so they negotiated. We cut it into a day. 
by the time we were ending the day, they were begging me and apologizing. <laughs> I mean, now we see what you're talking about. And so, and so I'm always negotiating. And when somebody's pushing back, I'm like, okay, let's just take a step. Let's just do this. And I see that once they experience what you've been telling them, then, you know, everything else is easy. So it's all about creating that experience, which is very difficult to do all the time. Yeah. I'm curious, I wanna hear from you, Gabriella. Uh, what are you hearing in, and seeing in terms of how leaders are reacting to uh, the agile mindset, mindset and, and the agile approach in your area? Uh, I am hearing uh, Abby uh, telling this, uh, this scenario and yeah, what I see is that very, it's very hard to give uh, the first chance for like agile, for like agile practices, techniques. Uh, but uh, on the first moment that leaders can, could recognize the efficiency, uh, how they could decrease loss, they could uh, increase quality, for example, and the uh, customer satisfied, uh, I believe they will embrace with the time. Uh, and what I see here, it's a big challenge regarding uh, giving clear goals for the team. So it's something that is uh, like leaders in general are improving, but it's still a challenge. Uh, giving clear goals for the team, give responsibility and give space for the team to have autonomy. Uh, and also um, employee engagement, I believe it's still a challenge here. So for example, I don't know in other countries, but in Brazil, it's pretty hard to hire, to recruit good uh, professionals. So uh, companies uh, are trying to engage employees and uh, keep them at the company with uh, programs, with motivation, uh, purpose, um, money also. So that's a, a big challenge for us in Brazil to keep the employees with us. Thanks, Gabriella. Yeah, you know, there, there are definitely uh, plenty of challenges with getting leadership on board. Uh, and it's always interesting to hear, you know, some of those differences uh, in other places. Chanan, what are you seeing in terms of how leaders are reacting to uh, this agile mindset? Yeah, so so I, I, I do see that like the delivery is, is their dominant thoughts in their mind. So if they let go the power, what happens to the delivery? So that fear is always driving them significantly to like holding the holding the accountability authority. So so they they always love to hold that power. So that's the biggest challenge. And especially like um, uh, through agile approach, you are popularizing that, yes, you should have a growth aspect. You should have experimental mindset. But again, there is always a cost. Uh, delivery is the driving factor for most of the leaders. And, and, and that is the barrier which always they're struggling with, like how much I should let go, how much flexibility I should give, how much actually the innovation space I should give. So that's, that's always a, a tussle which a leader is go through. Like when we talk about informal chat, like, okay, how ideally a leader should build a, uh, that servant leadership trade. So it's, it's difficult to practice, but uh, easy to actually preach. But, but the struggle is there is how do I let go those things? Because uh, I have habituated for last 20, 25 years by doing the micromanagement. Now, if I let go, what will happen to me? How do I see the visibility? All those challenges, things comes to their mind. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All, so that's the kind of tussle every leader goes through. Sure, go ahead, Ola. Yeah, follow up question to you, Chandan. Uh, yeah, I will think about uh, um, do they feel that this letting go is something permanent, or do do they understand that we could actually experiment with letting go a little bit, a week or two, and then evaluate the result, getting this inspect and adaption mindset? What is your experience? Yeah. So I, I do see that like some some leaders are, I see that there is a limitation of their way of leadership style. Like they are not influential leaders. They have become leader because of delivery success or something like this. So they do not exercising those charismatic styles. So 
uh, and and as if they let go so they have the fear in mind that like what will be the impact in, because at the end of the day the measurement is based on the delivery so most of the leaders what i have seen like here especially in india it's mostly delivery 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 deadline 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 so so ability, like influencing traits um, the room is very less so, so they would like to hold it but of course some leader i have seen that they have a guts to really experiment and really learn from it and then really course correct but uh, it's a um, it's a ever going uh, like a challenge what i see at every leader like some leaders are adopting but said. most of the leaders are, are struggling and yeah <laughs> Yeah, crazy. And and I like something that you said, Chandan, around experimentation, uh, because when we think about, you know, at least in my experience, uh, earlier on, folks were not as uh, they were not as in tune with running experiments, or you know, they maybe would try things, but not yeah. in a more structured way to say, okay, well, similar to what Ola said, yeah. we're going to run an experiment, we're going to do it for you know, two weeks, uh, we're gonna do it for one sprint or something like that. So I am curious and I want to hear uh, uh, from Ola first, uh, how do you see Agile evolving? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, yeah, the, I think that the, the um, realizations comes in, in, in kind of waves. I, I, I don't know about you, but, but uh, it, for me, it was like, okay, I was in, in the software business and I, I, I had this belief about big, designs up front, I had this belief in, in, in plans and I realized that, well, that's not going to work because of just all the insights that we're getting along the way. We need to have a, a kind of a structure to handle change. And from that, I realized that, okay, this is everything that's talking about quick, quick um, feedback loops from the market, from, from the, how, how does this architecture in software plays out in reality? How, how do people respond? How, how the, insight about the limits of our consciousness or the limitations of our ability to plan ahead and okay so let's scrap that and instead start to focusing on be able to handle change instead of focusing on, on be able to follow the plan if you the, the fourth value in the manifest so and that is a, is, is, is a realization and and you you notice that that people who comes after you they 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 also have this realization after a while and after a while and after a while so you can see that almost like a wave, people getting the first realizations now while other people in the organizations are getting even more realizations but the people that getting the first realizations now they are not there yet so it's like a wave floating through or flowing through the organization, where 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 we can this these these realizations comes in in, in levels and and now. Uh, I'm involved in, in uh, two major transformations and a couple of minor uh, companies in Sweden. One of them is really big multinational. So we're talking about with people from all, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And what we see there is that, that uh, some people, just a few, understand that even the agile transformation or the agile evolution within the company also need to be done in an agile way. There are lots exactly. of people believing that, well, we should install these feedback loops, this inspection and adaption when it comes to the products, but the change, the transformation, that needs to be ADCAR and uh, Cotter stepwise plan ahead. No, the same, the, the, the same reasons why inspection and adaption and navigating and, and evolving and experimenting is good for products. The exact same reasons apply to organizational change and transformation as well. You need to yeah. install agility in an agile way. And the, the problem is that there are too few in the, the leadership who, who understands that even when we do this large scale agile transformation in a company where the leadership has realized that the agile ways of working when it comes to the product is good. They haven't really understand yet, understood yet that the agile approach is good also, or it's necessary, essential also for the agile transformation in itself. And that yes. is, is, is a problem. Yes, and, and man, I, I like really wanna jump into the business agility part, but I'll, I'll still have to wait because I wanna hear from others on where they think agile is evolving to. Uh, so Gabriella, uh, where do you see agile evolving? 
So I understand uh, agility as a journey, as just Ola said, it's something that uh, the company and people are improving with the time. Uh, and I see many companies saying something like, oh, I want to be agile. And I want to do those uh, ceremonials and I want to have a product backlog. Uh, I can be a scrum master and so on. But Spotify. it's not something that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's not a it's not a like a software that we install on the company or a CD that we introduce on the company. So um, I, I believe that com some companies are understanding that it's a journey uh, that you can apply some techniques. Maybe, for example, maybe Scrum is not the ideal. Maybe Kanban is not the ideal. Maybe you should uh, choose some practices and apply for your context. So uh, I believe that many companies are adopting some parts of some frameworks, for example, SAFE and others, uh, mm -hmm. and are embracing the results once they see, since they see uh, results on the business and on the market, financial results also. That's what I yes. see. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, you know, taking those, pardon the pun, incremental steps, you know, to get there uh, is, critical, you know, to get that buy-in um, from leadership uh, because, you know, sometimes that's what they do in the way that the transformation will evolve. It is similar to what Ola says, it's like it's, it's a wave within the organization. It's not always, you know, that big bang thing. Chandan, what are you seeing as far as Agile evolving? Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting journey I'm seeing um, like a, yeah, now I'm seeing a lot of people, okay, under Agile umbrella, they are getting into like uh, uh, Lean UX and design thinking. I'm seeing extensively these people are exercising this technique to really get into the customer's mind. Like how can I actually exercise those techniques to really know more about my customer? Because at the end of the day, for them, I am building the solution. So Scrum is just building like an execution part, but how about that exploring part about the problem? So they are getting into this problem space and deep submerging into the problem space to build the right product by Scrum. So I'm seeing it is evolving into that front funnel, like even the budgeting and those aspects also, Agile is getting into that area, fixing that area in the upstream part. Nice. And Abby, so what are you saying? So what, I, what I'm seeing is, um, uh, uh, different uh, different parts of the organization uh, are beginning to understand that, uh, like the enterprise, the enterprise is beginning to understand that agile doesn't start and end with uh, technology. Uh, people are uh, understanding that and appreciating that uh, it has to be enterprise and every, all hands on deck and every aspect of the organization needs to be engaged uh, with regards to uh, the agile journey and uh, adoption and transformation as a whole. Nice. So in that evolution that's taking place within organizations, uh, one of the areas that I've seen that has begun to come along uh, has been HR. Um, and, and I am a big proponent that in every transformation, like from the day the transformation starts, that you need to try to penetrate all the way through to HR at some point. Uh, and, and until you can reach HR, it's gonna be very difficult to truly, truly have that culture shift, that true transformation take place and so forth, because you have to have that type of infrastructure in place. So what are you seeing in terms of the role of Agile uh, that it's playing in organization design specifically? Mm. So um, honestly, uh, what has happened in uh, my experience in Nigeria, as well as uh, the Middle East specifically, is that, uh, so we know the culture issue, right? <clears throat> now there's also something called politics that happens in the workplace. Uh, I always separate that from culture, <laughs> funny. And um, when you now start to 
help them understand what you just said now, Quincy. And uh, they now, everybody now knows the role they need to play and uh, they understand that it's going to be enterprise wide. There's this politics thing that pops up. And I use the word who is going to be the driver of this engagement. And it has to come from within. And I'm just going to be a navigator and, uh, and holding whoever it is. And so that politics kicks in and um, head of PMO wants to drive the whole change. Um, HR, head of HR, CHRO or head of HR. Uh, and sometimes they have like a strategy and innovation unit they also want to drive. And so there was uh, an engagement I had a few years ago in Nigeria with a major bank and uh, it got stalled because of this. And there was another bank who was able to overcome this. Uh, another bank in the Middle East, uh, the project got stalled because of this. And, and so I, from all these experiences that I'm finding that are happening with the politics and who wants to be the driver because should that thing win, if it wins and the organization gets on that right track and they're having all these cost savings and all of those type of things, what people know or people think is that the um, rewards will go to that individual. The person's bonuses will go up and recognition and all those type of things. So they're trying to own those things individually. And so there's still a lot of work that I'm doing and people around me here to help them understand how this thing works and to help organization understand the role of a driver and the driver can be an individual person. Uh, also, uh, it's always best when HR is also the driver because they are usually the facilitator for people, for policies and for a lot of things within the organization. And so, um, with the advent of uh, business agility, which I'm part of the community here in Nigeria as well, we've been able to get support and materials to help educate people more. And they're able to spend time, read these things, you know, we're sharing, the pushing it out to organizations for them to read, educate themselves so that, you know, they can find better ways of managing this. Yeah. And Ola, you wanted to jump in. Yeah. Um... The, the 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 role of HR is absolutely crucial, and that can work in two ways. In in, in two ways, in my experience, uh, just like uh, like like you were were into Abby, uh, we talked about the one misconception that that many HR departments in large organizations have is that they actually run the whole business. They, many of them believe that, well, people actually follow the procedures we put up. People actually are yeah. doing this because of what we say. When, when, when you go down on the floor on the gamble where, where the real action happens, you notice that, well, people are rounding HR and yes. let them exist in, in their own bu bubble. So uh, that is a problem, uh, especially when you st start to do transformation because the, the agile transformations, they touch so many points so that you can't round, you, you can't bypass HR anymore. Mm -hmm. You need to involve them. And all of a sudden, the, the common uh, for results for, for traditional HR is coming with, oh, then you must please fill in this form with the role description of an agile coach. This form of a role description of a role description of, and we said, well, hold your second, we, we cannot, these are not separate things. These are not separate entities. We need to look at the relationships. Oh, we don't manage relationships. We manage individual roles. Okay, but the agility happens in the relationships in the, the exactly. space in between. You need to get tools to open up your eyes. And I have a very, very close friend here in Sweden. And she's really a pioneer in, in, in Agile HR, Pia Mediatorian, uh, wrote this book, uh, Agile People, a couple of years ago. Uh, she has been really a pioneer and, and pointing out, and she was the one who, who opened my eyes to, to the role that you need to, you need to handle HR and Absolutely. you need to re reform HR. You need to get a critical mass of people at HR understanding what's going on so that they can affect their own internal processes or else they could just pop out and, and, and undermine the whole thing. But when they are on board, they can leverage, they can be a, a leverage. So it's super important, crucial 
really Absolutely. up to HR. And, and I've often, you know, found it interesting. And, and, you know, this is one of the things that once I can get closer to HR and a transformation uh, that I like to bring up, which is, let's say, for example, Scrum. Well, if we succeed as a team or we fail as a team, then why do I have an individual performance rating that affects me only um, as opposed to being uh, incentivized by being more of a team, uh, having a team effort. And so yeah. that then says, well, now we have to change how we're measuring success yeah. for individuals by measuring success for the team. There are no performance management or talent management systems that looks at the whole team. I, I do a lot of trainings mm -hmm. and, and I have certain trainings that address the team as a team. And then HR pops up and say, well, actually, three members of this seven people team have already undergone that training so you should only give it to the four of them but i say hey it's for the team yeah you it's, it's not that the individuals in, undergo this training the team undergoes this training and they say exactly. oh we don't have support in our systems for that yeah let me i want to hear from chan and seems like you were kind of itching to say something there so yeah. i want to give you that opportunity. Yeah, so <clears throat> So I, I, I analogy that uh, transmission is like a <clears throat> brain surgery. So it's very complex. So whenever you open it up, like you, you never know what will happen. So whenever this type of transformation happen, actually, there is always a, a re, especially the reorg, like where there's a role transformation happen, reskilling happen, and um, that huge monolithic project management organization suddenly becomes scrum squad. So many chapters, new new roles comes, so it becomes very messy. So especially this HR and with the help of that child coach, we need to really streamline this. It takes a lot of initially in the floor there will be a lot of turbulence. So the HR is the enabler who can actually, with the help of agile coaches, can bring this entire chaos into a, into a calm state. But of course, we need a significant help from this HR to actually rewrite some of those role and reskill some of this outdated role, especially we have many in, in India because we have a bulk bunch of project managers where they have been rigid in, in, in certain <laughs> execution process. So significant work is there in that HR joint venture with Agile Coast to bring a new generation or new new blood into the organization. Yeah. I'm seeing. And so Gabriella, what are you saying uh, when it comes to the role that HR, uh, that Agile is playing in organization design? Uh, so I can give as an example, uh, BRQ, where uh, I am working. Uh, we uh, lead uh, a transformation on the company so uh, we had a, a, a big challenge that was how we could uh, put, clo uh, put more effort in building the relationship between the business itself that delivers software, for, for example, and HR. So uh, one step that we did, we started to have interviews on the, for the recruitment team. We start to have interviews between the candidate employee, the uh, recruiter, and also the project manager. So with this uh, new step, we could guarantee that we will have uh, the point of view of uh, a project manager and also an interviewer, uh, HR person, right? So we started small uh, experimentals and uh, some tests in order to uh, guarantee that everyone would have the same uh, business and agile overview of the company. Nice. All right. So uh, all of this has been uh, unscripted uh, so far. These, they, you know, our guest panelists knew about the topics, but we didn't uh, go over anything in terms of uh, let's talk through it and, and uh, see what everyone was going to say. So we didn't do that. Uh, but there was one question that I did tell everyone that I was going to ask and I wanted them to think about uh, ahead of time. All right, so I'm gonna ask this question and we'll just go uh, one by one and hear the response. So the question is, if you were to take on the personification of Agile as a parent and Scrum was your child, what stage of development would 
your child be? Based on the area, based on your clients and so forth, what stage of development would your child be? So let's start with Ola. Yeah, okay. Um, if I was mother agile and my, I had my daughter scrum, I would uh, look at her and seeing that, yeah, she's, she's doing pretty good well, she understands much of what it means, but I, I would feel concern because she will feel like a seven year old who were too rigid in her thinking to, and, and a bit shy, a bit unwilling to experiment, a bit not so free willing. Okay, she, she doesn't yet have, have, have got all the, the, um, the, the problems that her older sister safe has. <laughs> lots of complexities and, and 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 everything and trying to be the the master of everything but but i will still feel that she's a bit rigid and i would figuring out thinking at night okay how can i help her opening up how can i help her be more uh, more open to to different variants of things nice chandan if you took on the personification of agile and scrum was your child yeah. what stage so of I development <laughs> Yeah, I see my child is behaving differently in different contexts. So I worked with the bank for uh, for three years and that bank has actually uh, transformed for the last 10 years. So in that context, uh, my child has become adult. I could see child to grow into that maturity where the, the child scrum is actually behaving appropriately it's supposed to be. But in the context where I am now, I am seeing um, my, my child is little baby, <laughs> actually, not even not even actually able to talk properly because in the context where I am operating, uh, it just started the journey. So I am seeing it is very situational, like based on the journey that child has traversed and the kind of scenario that it has passed through, the maturity has evolved. So that's what I will be interpreting It's the context. Like if the journey has started earlier, they have actually traveled through different types of challenges and become mature over a period of time. So right now my baby is very young in the, my current context. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and how about you, Gabriela? Uh, so I work, nowadays I work mainly with uh, banks, with like financial market uh, and uh, Based on that, I believe that Scrum would be a young adult. It's something with some level of maturity. And because, just because uh, an expressive number of companies are adopting Scrum, or at least some parts of Scrum, some ceremonials or some, uh, uh, some parts of them, of it, uh, but I believe this is, there is still uh, space to improve and to learn and improve the maturity level. So that's why there, there are some experience and some level of maturity, but it's still there is a long way to learn and get better. Thanks. All right, Abby. Uh, for me, I would go with uh, Chandan's approach. Uh, while I was in Canada, I would say uh, being a, a parent and Scrum was my child, uh, Scrum was about, uh, Scrum was formed like a 12 year old, 13 year old, like a new teenager and was just uh, trying to, you know, kind of uh, accept and embrace things about life and, you know, understanding it and being independent and trying to, you know, make certain decisions and do stuff on their own. Uh, in my new environment in Nigeria, I would say Scrum is about uh, a two-year-old uh, throwing uh, tantrums, just started working and, um, and uh, you know, seeking attention and saying, yeah, yeah, I can do it by myself and then messes up and uh, you have to go in there and, you know, fix everything and say, don't do that again. And then you turn your back and, pfft, right? So that's... Uh, <laughs> That's my experience. Nice. Uh, one, yeah. real, one, real, one real pro problematic thing with that question is that, that uh, as mother agile, I would be like 19 years old and my daughter scrum would be 25. If we look at the timeline of how things develop. That's, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, it's, so from my perspective and, and experience, I would say scrum is more, 
like a uh, late teenager. So they're, they're not an early teenager, but they're a late teenager. They're, they know enough to know that they, they do really know some stuff. Uh, they know enough to uh, really actually be effective at some things and make some progress. Um, but they're coming to the point to where they're going to start realizing they don't quite know as much as they think they do. And there's a lot more to still learn. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, that's, that's where I would say that uh, Scrum would be if, if, if I were agile and Scrum was my child. All right, so we are, we're getting close to the time. There's one area that I wanted to touch on, uh, which I know this is a loaded area, so I know there's no possible way for us to really dig deep into this, uh, but I do want to have some opportunity to discuss it a little bit. What type of impact have you seen COVID-19 make in the agile space um, specifically? And for myself, you know, I've seen where companies who, for example, said, yeah, okay, well, we may start having remote teams. Uh, you know, that's something, we'll put that into second or third quarter for next year, we'll work towards that, we'll see. And they went from talking about it that way to in two weeks getting there. And so it, from my pr perspective, it really accelerated what people thought they could not do and prove that they could do, do other things. What, what was your experience, um, Gabriella? Uh, so first of all, I agree with you totally. Uh, I see many companies that are changing the way uh, they work, the way they communicate with employees, the, the way that we create, for example, relationship between the teams and between people. Uh, and everything is different now. Uh, some companies, and uh, my company uh, includes, uh, started uh, home office all the time in like one week at most. So we changed it. You had to change our infrastructure, uh, provide chairs for employees, provide tables, uh, extra monitors, and so on. So. Uh, some politics, uh, employees' politics are changing. Uh, the way that we communicate are changing also. And I see a big challenge, which is, uh, as I just mentioned, give like clear goals and clear expectations for the employees and give them space to do the job. Because uh, in on that moment, leaders cannot stay just, uh, just on the side of the an employee, right? giving some structures, inst instructions, uh, and like taking some control on the job. So also I, be I believe that this uh, relationship between employees and managers are very different nowadays. Thanks. All right, what about you, Chandan? Yeah, I see a little bit impact in terms of collaboration. Like earlier time, whenever we used to discuss, we used to go to board, we used to have a brainstorm, we used to have a lot of free flowing thoughts. Now, because of this COVID, everything has been restricted. There is a, that, that innovation speed has, has come down. Of course, technology has given us opportunity, but it has its own limitation in terms of human relationship, which is significantly impacting in terms of like the way we used to interact in agile, when it's like face-to-face -face collaboration, maximizing the impact and customer collaboration. All those aspects has been a little bit impacted, but uh, the facilitator is trying best to overcome it. But of course, facilitator is also getting loaded because everything has to be plan twice, like if plan A, plan B, all these kind of activities are happening in every scrum events or any PI demo kind of thing. So there is an impact in terms of the human, the way we used to work. Uh, we are just thinking innovative way to overcome all those challenges. Um, hopefully <laughs> we'll, we'll become better, but but still we are trying to go to office. <laughs> I would just to really get that feel, uh, even in Corona also, to really get that feel, get that innovation, get that collaboration. So, there are impacts, so you're trying to overcome. All right. And what about you, Ola? Well, um, for I've been working with multinational companies uh, for the last four years, 
And uh, what we used to have was like, you had meetings in the office and you had a remote link to, to another team in another office, for instance, and, and we were in Sweden and they were in India or uh, Nigeria for that matter, or Hong Kong or, and, and there was always a thing that they were remote and we were the center because we were in Sweden, mm. we were the, 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 the main company. It has actually become more kind of democratic or, or more equal when we all meet like this exactly we are yeah. we are in different places of the world so so we that uh, i've always stressed that hey let's all meet online because that's the most everyone should have the same band bandwidth but people have been reluctant now all of a sudden this is the new normal that that's a good thing mm -hmm. uh, bad thing when i coach teams i cannot really read the room and there are lots of opportunities for people to have chats to have communication uh, mm -hmm. channels and and so so you can see that certain certain things get more problematic on the other hand when having one to one conversations i feel that that people are opening up more easily when 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 we talk to them uh, over the 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 screen so the the there's definitely this is definitely a new deal and some things that had been hard are now much easier and something that had been easier is now much harder so it's it, it can just shift the balance yeah. and that's interesting in, in its own right yeah completely agree what about you abby yes i will piggyback on some of the things ola had said uh so in general um uh, the effect of covid has been that uh organizations now had to do most of the things that Agile had been preaching. So collaborations, remote work and all of that. So people started moving in that direction, organizations started moving in that direction. So I, my, my team, we, we were putting out the information about how you're going to save money on infrastructure and all of those things, but then you have to uh, save money on, uh, sorry, save money on real estate and then invest more in infrastructure. And so people started embracing tools. People get, got more knowledgeable about using tools like Zoom and some of the things. But then uh, some of the issues that came out is, for example, if you're on Teams, like Ola was saying, it blocks you out. You can't, you don't have access to seeing, like once you go into presentation mode, you can't see the people. So it looks like you're just talking to yourself. That interaction is gone. So people really don't like it. And uh, a lot of organizations were working remotely. And so they, they weren't feeling that uh, participation, that zeal, that passion from the people, especially when you're doing an agile transformation, come on, right? During this whole period, you can imagine, yes. you know, the face-to-face -face thing isn't, isn't doing it. And the mindset, I wouldn't say culture this time, I would say the mindset. So the mindset of most organizations in Nigeria is they believe that if they can't see you working, you're probably not working. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, uh, and that's not just Nigeria. Up. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> and so, and so uh, it's cut across even with training. So organizations want to send their employees to training, and they just think that, hmm, will this will this training be cost effective for me? Because they're they're sitting down in their house, probably not paying attention. So a lot of training were were put on hold. I know one client of mine who waited. This was a training that was supposed to happen February slash March. COVID happened, we they waited, we had that training second week of September. They want, they said, you know what, we thought about it, we thought about it, we thought about it. It has to be a face-to-face, -face. it has to be a physical. And so now that things are, well, lockdown is gone and normalcy, well, almost is going back in Nigeria. People are going back to work. And unfortunately we now had the NSARS protest and some stuff happened, but before mm -hmm. then people started to come out of their, you know, lockdown, out of their restrictions, you know, lifting all of that and saying that, you know, we now we're ready. And I don't really think we can do a hundred percent remote uh, type of work in, in Nigeria. I think it's going to be uh, maybe 40% uh, versus 60% where 60% is face-to-face -face and maybe some people would do uh, remote. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Positive, somewhat. It's been positive, but overall, people prefer the face-to-face -face that Agile has been talking about. Yeah. All right. 
Thanks, Abby. And we are right at the time, so do not drop yet. Uh, there's one other thing I want to share uh, for everyone. Screen dump, everyone. Screen dump. All right. Uh, and I want to make sure you're seeing the right screen. So are you seeing presentation mode or are you seeing speaker view, Quincy? You are seeing speaker view. All right. So I need to switch. Uh, I, I, see, I see presentation mode. All right. The one with two, there we go. That's the bigger version. All right. So uh, this is, if you have the LinkedIn app on your phone, you can take the LinkedIn app and uh, literally just put it up to the screen and get the QR code. Uh, so for all of our panelists, um, there was a request for um, folks to have the opportunity to connect on LinkedIn, um, which is a great tool. It's one of the things that helped us to be able to do this today. Uh, so I wanted to give an opportunity for everyone to do that. Uh, you just literally go to your app and click on, I believe it's network or your connections. Uh, and then it'll give you the option to get to the QR code. And all you do is just scan each one uh, and it will give it to you. Uh, this will, I believe, also be part of the recording. Uh, later that you will have access to. So even if you can't catch it now, you may be able to catch it later. Uh, so hopefully you were able to do that. And then last but not least, uh, I want to not only thank our panelists uh, for participating today, but I wanna thank Adele Thought um, for allowing uh, me to host this and for getting behind this and uh, having our guests here. So we very much appreciate it. Appreciate it. I appreciate everyone's participation. I hope that everyone got a lot out of this today. Uh, I was super excited about it and just really hope that uh, everyone enjoys the rest of their day. So thanks everyone. We will conclude there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.